All right. If you guys have a Bible, would you open up to Luke chapter 10? Luke chapter 10. We're going to look at verses 25 through 37. Thursday night, if you were with us, we talked about our vertical relationship with the Lord being the most important relationship that we have in our lives. So in light of that, having heard that, understood that from Deuteronomy chapter 6, what I'm getting ready to ask you to do is potentially loaded. So I want you to take a piece of paper or type it into your phone, your notes, whatever. Uh, I want you to list out your top five relationships currently. Those relationships don't necessarily have to be names of individuals. It may be um, consider your relationship with your work. Um, so your job may be uh, on that priority list. But what are the top five relationships in your life currently? And I trust that as you're as you're writing those out, that you're being honest and you're not writing them in the order that you think they should be, but you're actually writing them in the order that they are. And here's what I want to argue for in this session from Luke chapter 10 is this, that our love for neighbors comes from a thriving relationship with the Lord. So I want you to look at the five relationships that you listed out where is your relationship with the lord in those five is it at the top or is it somewhere else in those five or did it not even make the top five i think that our love for neighbors if we're to do that well in a way that honors the Lord, it comes from a thriving relationship with him first. Look with me at Luke chapter 10, beginning in verse 25. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, this will be familiar to you, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly, do this and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan... As he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own, on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you. When I come back, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. Let's pray. Father God, thanks for your word. Um, God, thank you for the commands that we see in 
your word, God. Thank you for um, scripture passages like this where uh, we can read your teachings to others. God, that uh, we can understand those things. God, we can apply those things to our lives. Holy Spirit, would you help us to do that uh, as we work through this text this morning? For your glory, God, we pray these things in your name. Amen. <clears throat> so, uh, before we dig into this text, uh, a few of you have asked this morning, I just want to say thank you for being a good neighbor and being concerned for my eyesight and the size of my Bible. Um, thank you. I appreciate that. But yes, I can read it. Um, but yes, my eyesight is getting worse. So, what I can see in the text is this interesting question that a lawyer poses to Jesus. Now, he encounters Jesus and addresses him as teacher. So he's at least respecting who Jesus is as a rabbi or a teacher. And he asks him this question, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So the lawyer is asking Jesus who has been walking through these towns, teaching, asking and calling people to follow him. And now this lawyer comes to him and says, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? What, what is it that I can do so that I can spend eternity with God? And Jesus asked him, what is written in the law? So this Jewish leader responds, knowing the law, and quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 6. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. He, he knows that. He knows that the law says this is the first and most important relationship. I should do this. I should love the Lord my God, with all of my heart and all of my soul and all of my strength and all of my mind. And your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus responds to him and says, you've answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But then the lawyer poses this question to Jesus. Who is my neighbor. Who is my neighbor? Now, I think that's a question that we have to ask ourselves, right? Who is my neighbor? And what's interesting is I think that he's asking this question, not seeking to truly understand what Jesus is teaching, but he's looking for a loophole. I know that none of us have ever looked for a loophole in anything. We've never uh, used excuses to not do what we were supposed to do, what God specifically laid out for us. <clears throat> if you look at Matthew chapter 22, Matthew chapter 22, in, in which Jesus is sharing this commandment, he says in verse 34, but when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him, right? Uh, this is uh, uh, the same encounter. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Shall love your neighbor as yourself. So, who is my neighbor? This lawyer is looking for a loophole because he wants to know that it's okay not to consider certain people, certain individuals, or certain groups as his neighbor so that he doesn't have to love them, right? But who is my neighbor? The short answer is this everyone. Everyone And Jesus says that you need to love your neighbor as yourself. So understanding who we are in Christ, 
our vertical relationship with the Lord being the most important relationship that we have, right? Giving everything to that relationship, loving the Lord our God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and then loving our neighbor as ourselves. So in the way that God calls us to... Um, to discipline ourselves and to love ourselves as a created being in the image and likeness of God, so we now reflect that love towards our neighbor. Who is our neighbor? Everyone. So Jesus gives him an example here. Verse 30. Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem, to Jericho and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed leaving him half dead now by chance a priest was going down that road and when he saw him he passed by on the other side so likewise a Levite when he came to the place and saw him passed by on the other side but a Samaritan as he journeyed came to where he was and when he saw him he had compassion. Now, there's some interesting characters here in this particular story. Jesus says that there was a man coming down from Jerusalem to Jericho. So this man is coming from Jerusalem, most likely a Jew. And he is robbed. It says the robbers stripped him and beat him and then left him half dead on the side of the road. Now there's three other characters that we need to pay attention to. The first is the priest. Verse 31, now by chance a priest was going down that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Now, <clears throat> anybody ever read the Old Testament? Yes, no, it's, it's okay. Like, I mean, there are parts of the Old Testament that are really hard to read. But if you look in the Old Testament, God has called certain groups of people to do certain things in the nation of Israel. So he has called Aaron, Moses' brother, to be priest and Aaron's line to to be priest who would go in to the the um, to the tent eventually to the temple and they would offer sacrifices to God on behalf of the people right so you have a priest that's who Jesus is referencing here that this man has been robbed he's been stripped of the things that he has he's been beaten and he's been left half dead on the side of the road, and the first person to come by him is a priest. The one who would have been responsible to go into the temple to meet with God and to offer sacrifice because of the sins of the people on behalf of the people. So let me put it in present context. A man has been beaten and left half dead on the side of the road, and by chance, a pastor is walking down that road, sees the man on the side of the road, unsure of his condition, but enough that he doesn't want to be inconvenienced. So he changes to the other side of the road so as to pass by. And then Jesus continues in the story in verse 32. He says, so likewise, a Levite when he came to the place and saw him pass by on the other side. Now the Levites were of the tribe of Levi and their responsibility in the nation of Israel was to assist the priest. Okay, so, so think of them as um, <clears throat> support staff. Okay, uh, the, the priest is the, the pastor, the, the leadership, and, and then the, the Levites would be the, the support staff, the other directors or volunteers around them who would do certain things. <clears throat> and Jesus says that the Levite did the same as the priest, that when he came to the place where the man was 
on the side of the road that he passed by on the other side. And then verse 33. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. Here's what's so interesting about this. Does anyone know what a Samaritan is? What is it? Go ahead. Yes, yes. They were known as half-breeds. So, <clears throat> go back to the Old Testament, okay? You have the nation of Israel, right? Uh, the Israelites, contrary to what they have been led to in be separate from other nations, the people of Israel say, we want to be like the other nations, so we want a king. So, God gave them what they wanted. He gave them a king. A guy named Saul who would not follow the ways of God, who would lead the people um, to not worship the God of Israel. And the result was that God removed his hand from Saul and anointed David as the next king. Eventually, David's son would become king. And then the nation would be split. Eventually it would split into two kingdoms. You had the northern kingdom, which was also known as Israel. Okay, So if you're reading through the Old Testament, you've got to keep up on that. The kingdom has split after King Solomon. And now the northern kingdom is referenced as Israel. The southern kingdom as Judah. Now the northern kingdom of Israel was attacked by the Assyrians, carried into captivity, right? The capital of the northern kingdom was Samaria. Eventually, Babylon would come in, attack the southern kingdom of Judah, carry them off into captivity. <clears throat> but what happened is when the people of God were in captivity, they began to marry those of other nations. So now you have the Samaritans, those who were Jewish in heritage, but had, um, <clears throat> had relations with non-Jews. Now you have Samaritans. So you fast forward to the New Testament. Jesus is walking the known world. Primarily, he's focused in Galilee, which is now the northern part. Samaria is um, <clears throat> the middle. Judea or Judah is the southern part. And Jesus says to the disciples, you have to understand this, that People would literally go out of their way to walk around Samaria. And Jesus said, I must go through Samaria. Now, understanding all of that, now you go back to the text. In verse 33, but a Samaritan a half-breed, one who, if the Samaritan was the one laying on the side of the road, there's no way that anyone would have stopped. But that Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw the man on the side of the road, he had compassion for him. So who is my neighbor? The short answer is everyone. When do I show love to my neighbor? The short answer is always. Always. The third question I want us to consider here is how do I show love? I want you to underline that word compassion at the end of verse 33. And then just, just listen to all that this Samaritan did. He went to him. 
and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. So he's performing first aid on this individual on the side of the road. Then he took him and he lifted him up and put him on his animal. And then he brought him into town to an inn to take care of him. He stayed there with him. And the next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper saying, take care of him while I'm gone. And whatever more you have to spend to care for him, I'll repay you when I come back. So not only does he just have compassion on him in the moment, his compassion continues because he doesn't just do first aid on the side of the road. He takes him into town, makes sure he is in a safe place, makes sure that he is cared for, makes sure that his hotel bill is paid, and is willing to pay whatever else the innkeeper needs to spend while he's gone. And then in verse 36, Jesus asked this question. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? Was it the priest? Was it the Levite? Or was it the Samaritan? And the lawyer answered him and said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. So how do I show love to my neighbor? First with compassion and then with mercy. If everyone is our neighbor and we're to have compassion and care for them, and we're to show them mercy, that means that we don't give them what they deserve. Here's what we have to understand in showing love towards our neighbor, that there is great risk involved. You know if you have ever had any sort of trouble in any relationship. That when you have been hurt by another person, it becomes more difficult the next time to show compassion towards them, right? Because you're afraid that you're going to get hurt again. God calls us to love Him with everything that we are, everything that we have, and then to love our neighbor as ourself, which means that there is risk any time you seek to love your neighbor that you could be hurt. But the possibility of that happening doesn't remove the command to love your neighbor. God still calls us to love, to show mercy. The lawyer answered, the one who showed mercy is the one who proved to be a neighbor. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. God, that's our, that's our prayer. God, that as we have experienced compassion and mercy from you in our relationship with you, God, that as you call us to go and to love our neighbor, God, that we would be able to show mercy towards them. That yes, we would understand that there's risk involved in extending a hand to care for someone providing a resource to someone to help meet a need. We understand that there's risk in that. But God, the risk is worth it for you to receive the glory and for them to know the compassion of our Lord. So God, help us to see people the way that you see them. 
God, that we would see people through gospel lenses as people who are created in the image and likeness of our God who need a Savior. God, may we show great compassion and mercy towards our neighbors for your glory. God, we pray this in your name. Amen.